Välkommen. Välkommen. Tervetuloa. Välkommen. Bounce. Uuda. Välkommen. Welcome to Testing Grounds from the Nordic Alliance of Artists Residencies on Climate Action. This is a bonus episode featuring Narka commissioned writer Mari McLeod and her story Kur Namara or Seasickness. My name is Mary McLeod and I am a writer from Glasgow, writing in both Gaelic and English. Mary was commissioned by Narka to create a short piece of fiction in Scottish Gaelic with an English translation. Along with Scots, Gaelic is one of Scotland's two indigenous languages. It used to be the most widely spoken language in Scotland, but now only a small part of the population speaks it. But there's a growing interest in how Gaelic language and culture can help us build healthier relationships with the land, with ecosystems and with each other. Mary took inspiration for her writing commission from a well-known Scottish folktale, The Selkie Wife. Which is a story that comes in many different forms, lots of different iterations across Scotland and across generations. Selkies are mythical beings that can shapeshift. When they're in the sea, they live as seals, but they can also come onto the land. By removing their seal skins, they can take on human form. I've always been really inspired by these folkloric aspects of storytelling, especially in Scotland. So I wanted to write a story that reimagined the tale of the Selkie in a kind of context of changing seas, changing coastal environments for the the current climate. Are these stories that you grew up with? Definitely stories that I grew up with, but the Selkie one in particular. When we were growing up, my sister and I had a book called Stories by Fireside, and it was a collection of different stories written by Shirley Hughes, famous children's author, and I had these beautiful illustrations of it. And the Selkie story just always really stood out to me because it just made me really sad, but it was also quite scary. The illustrations were quite dark. So I always kind of saw it as a dark, sad story. And yeah, that's kind of where I first heard about the Selkies. But then as you get older, you kind of realise that these stories are kind of everywhere in Scotland. But that's where I first kind of got into them. I wrote the story when I was at the Sari residence in Finland and I was there for two months which was an absolutely magical inspiring time and I wrote that kind of being inspired by the natural environment around me even though we were in kind of the forest surrounded by trees I was just thinking about these kind of stories that you tell around the fire Not that many of us do that nowadays, but that would have been told around a fire. And the time at Sari was just absolutely incredible. It's a kind of place where you kind of lose all concept of time and space and you're just in a complete bubble away from the quote unquote real world. And you're surrounded by interesting people. You're surrounded by beautiful landscape and we had snow for a good chunk of the time that we were there, probably about a month of snow, and I've never seen snow like it. Whenever anyone asks me, how was your time, I just say magical, because it truly was. And how did that actually come about, that you went to Surrey? So last year I took part in a residency at Cove Park, one of the other partners of Narca, and that was a young Gaelic writer's residency. So I was at Cove Park in Argyle for two weeks, so very different from two months. So that was a kind of snapshot of what a residency is like. And post-Cove Park, I was given the opportunity to take part in the Narca exchange programme for creatives who kind of produce work that comments on climate related issues. So that's how I ended up at Sari. At Sari there were I think 
nine of us in total, nine artists, creatives. We built up a really strong community and we all kind of helped each other. And I was really inspired by all the work that all the other artists were doing. And I think without having that contact with them, I probably wouldn't have produced the amount or the kind of quality of work that I did produce. So I think that's a really important aspect of residencies in general, but in particular Sari has done a really good job of kind of facilitating that. And can you tell us about how you actually got to Sari? Yes. So rather than flying to Finland, which would have probably taken about three hours, I travelled via slow travel. I was very lucky to get funding for that from the Kone Foundation, which fund Sari. So how I travelled was via Glasgow to Edinburgh, down to London, Eurostar to Brussels, train to Hamburg, train to Copenhagen, train to Stockholm, and then the final leg of the journey was the overnight ferry from Stockholm to Turku in Finland. So it took me about five days, I think, in total, and that was doing it as fast as I could do it. Even though it was slow travel, it still felt like it was all happening very fast, and before I knew it, I was at Sari in a little cabin. So, yeah, that was pretty cool. You just get little tasters of culture along the way, whereas when you travel by air, you get on a plane at point A, you come off at point B, and you've got no kind of concept of all the places that you've passed over in that time to get from point A to point B. So I think it's just being able to get tasters of a city and of a place it makes sense, the kind of changes in culture along the way. Yeah, I would recommend for anyone to try and travel like that if it's possible. I know it can be difficult in terms of money and also time, but it is a really kind of special way of travelling. Why is it important to you that you work in both Gaelic and English? Writing in Gaelic, I think, is important for me in two ways. First, personally, because it's the language that my family have spoken, people that have come before me, like my granddad, my pshenar in Gaelic, he wrote in Gaelic as well. And for me, it's kind of like keeping on that family legacy, but then also there's the the kind of wider cultural legacy. And I think particularly when you're writing about environmental issues, it's important to understand that cultural sustainability is just as important as environmental sustainability. And that's kind of a hot topic in the Scottish Highlands and Islands. And if I can contribute, even though I'm a Glasgow Gale, if I can still contribute to sustaining our language then that's really important to me and I hope that I can continue to do that and really play a part in keeping the language but also the culture alive. And you mentioned a moment ago that NARCA were specifically commissioning artists, writers who are engaging with Mm -hmm. environmental issues, the climate crisis, whatever term we want to use. Why is that something you're interested in? Why do you engage with that in your work? It's kind of always been present for me, that kind of sense of justice for the planet, justice for animals and non-humans, but also justice for people in general and I think growing up I've always had that and it kind of started from like a love of animals and really caring about endangered animals and then as kind of a teenager you kind of learn more about climate and global warming and stuff like that and it just kind of developed as an interest over the years. I went on to study geography which kind of ties in the social and the natural sciences So I did that at university and did a master's in a course called Earth Futures. So it's always kind of been 
something that's interested me and I think that in terms of tackling these issues to really get to people's hearts being creative and producing creative work and artistic work that does that is really really important because technological solutions can always go so far but if you really want people to change then you need to pull the heartstrings a little bit in my view. Here is Mari reading her story, Seasickness, first in English and then in Gaelic. Even if, like me, you don't speak Gaelic, I'd really encourage you to listen to both versions. Seasickness. Cur na mara. The pair walked hand in hand along the sand, their anorak zipped up tightly. It was spring, and the sun was battling with the clouds and just about winning. But the wind from the sea was fierce and chilly. Ava, recently turned six years old, was restless and bouncy. It was the Easter holidays, which meant she was more excitable than usual as a week with her grandparents stretched out before her. The sea sighed in and out, breathing gently. Look, what's that over there? Ava shouted, letting go of her granddad's hand and bounding over to the rock pools. He followed on slowly, the torment of a dodgy hip hindering him. It was becoming more and more difficult to keep up with her on their escapades, and he tried to push the reality of the inevitable to the back of his mind. These days were far too important to him. It's a bird, Ava shouted back at him, dropping her litter picker to the ground and crouching down. When he finally caught up with her, his heart dropped. It was a gannet, entangled in netting. Stay back, Ava, he said, knowing the birds could be aggressive. It was alive, thank God, but its wings and webbed feet were pulled tightly to its body, stopping it from moving, and it was flailing its head around in distress. A resourceful man, he took the pliers he kept in his jacket pocket and began to snip the netting holding the bird's bill shut with one hand to avoid injury. With every snip, the bird's wings began to flap until eventually the netting came completely loose. Slowly, the man let go and the bird took flight, disappearing up into the rock face. Ava grabbed the netting with her litter picker, examining it closely, then stuffed it into the black bag. Shenar, if we didn't find that bird, would it have died? She asked. It may well have, he responded, but luckily you and your eagle eyes were on the case. Four years earlier, a sperm whale had been found on the beach in Shellabost. They said it had a hundred kilograms of litter in its stomach when it died. A big ball of human waste, just sitting inside its body. He'd had to hide the tear that streamed down his face when he saw it on the news, for fear his wife would call him an old fool. That was when he started doing the beach cleanups. When Ava was no longer wobbly on her feet, he'd started taking her with him. He didn't like to get too sentimental, but it was difficult when she came along. Being a parent had been a minefield, learning what to say and what to do. But being a grandparent, it was different. He got to give her the best parts of himself, and in return, she gave him hers. But he couldn't help but wonder what kind of world she'd live in long after he was committed to the ground. When their bags were full, they laid a picnic rug on the sand and sat side by side, watching as the waves beyond advanced and retreated gently. They wolfed down the well-earned sandwiches, made with the care of a wife and grandmother in the morning. Will you tell me one of your stories? Please, please, please... Ava exclaimed, licking the remnants of homemade raspberry jam from her fingers. Okay, okay, come and sit close to me. The man gazed out to the sea and thought of all the stories it had to tell. Well, there was once a young fisherman who had heard the tales of the seal folk, the Selkies, and how they came ashore and shed their skins. A man of logic, he considered himself too wise to believe such fairy stories. That was until he saw her, dancing and singing on the beach one summer's night, her song wistful and alluring. 
Her hair was as dark as the deepest corners of the ocean, her eyes as black as the night sky. Her seal skin was neatly folded on the rocks. Enticed by its shine, he swiped it and hurried home with his treasure. Soon after, the young seal woman appeared on his doorstep. Please, sir, I can't return to the sea without my skin, she pleaded. But he would not give her back her skin. Instead, he asked her to become his wife. Now, she had no desire to marry this strange man, but with the magnetic pull of her skin so strong, she was bewitched. And so she accepted, knowing she would one day take back what was hers and leave him lonely and feeble. But the years passed and she did not get her skin back. She scoured the house longingly, but her attempts were futile. The couple had a child, a girl, and she loved her dearly, but she missed her seal family in the sea. She would sit at the window gazing out at the ocean, thinking of them every day. The fisherman grew agitated and cruel as his yield of fish depleted and time bounded on. The men came from the south with their innovations and their noise, drowning out the soothing songs of the birds. Then fish came aplenty, dragged en masse from the sea, and so did the money. The seal woman's husband brought to her a solid gold necklace, as though her obedience and her love could be bought. Two decades passed, and the seal woman's sorrow grew stronger and stronger. One dark autumn night, her daughter, herself now a gallous young woman, came to her. Mother, I think I've found something that belongs to you, she said, carrying a large package wrapped tightly in plastic. Knowing exactly what it was, the woman leapt up in joy. She unwrapped the package and the sweet, seaweedy smell of the skin enveloped her. She ran through the village, barefooted in her nightdress, and down towards the sea, ready for its welcoming arms. When she reached the sand, she turned back to see her daughter had followed her. She gave her a final kiss as tears fell down her daughter's cheeks, the saltiness a blessing on the woman's lips. She ripped the gold necklace from her neck and placed it in her daughter's hands. Sell it and get away from here, she said, letting go of her child's cold fingers. Mother, please don't go. I have to go, my child. I'm going to be with the sea, where I belong. She wrapped her skin around her as she walked slowly into the salt water, awaiting the familiar metamorphosis. But her shape wouldn't change. She swam out with the skin heavy and cold on her back, knowing the currents would soon embrace her. But the sea... It had changed. It was not as it had been before. It was warmer, emptier, lifeless. Her skin wouldn't mould to her body as it had done before. It blistered and began to wither, losing its elasticity. An angry wave came and lifted her, depositing her at the water's edge like scrap. She lost her grip on her decaying seal skin and the currents whisked it away from her. She shivered as she watched it float like a carcass out the horizon before disappearing out of view. Have mercy on me, she bellowed to the waves. Let me return home. But the sea just roared back at her, ignoring her pleas. Birds cawed as they circled in the night sky, mocking her. She sang for her seal family, but heard nothing in response. They were gone. And so, she was sentenced to a life of misery on land, unable to return home. She made a shelter in a cave by the sea where she lived alone, vowing never to return to the man who had stolen her freedom so many moons ago. 
She watched on as the beaches were littered with debris and rottenness took hold of the sea. Some say that on the wind you can still hear her singing her tormented song, longing to return to the sea she once knew. Ava turned to her granddad with a look of disapproval, narrowing her eyes. That's not how the story goes, Shenar. She gets to go back to the sea and lives happily ever after with the seals and brings her family on the land lots of fish. We learned about it in school. Well, sweetie, the thing about stories is they are always changing, the old man said, just like the world around you. The story's yours now, and you have the power to change it, and so will your grandchildren after you. Well, I like the one Miss Macaulay told us better, she declared matter-of-factly. Your one was too sad. You're right, he said with a laugh. It probably was. Ava rose to her feet, then danced across the sand in her wellies. She spun round and round, twirling her litter picker like a baton. Come on, the beach isn't going to clean itself, she said, offering her granddad her hand to hoist him up. On the horizon, a seal poked its head above the water and watched them intently. Kur Namara Sea Sickness Koshi can ji shaka call it Iriganavi, and shaka chin chown mun boikin. Shen cherachavan is vagrian a burnachug on the hounds bachelin the scohen, a hast vagurna mare fia his fur. Va eva a vagirak beckin a sheer blian ergush a bock a deep and coursed. She served lie in the cash gavan, as by tolichug no fat shak in a gecolidia shenner. Va vur a gosna gusocher. Shall, jia shet, yev eva. A lick of ass and tina of acre son scutal a hokel, as a year you know gun the crickin. Lenin shall done your eke slurtoch, peen a cruach in a gopperer. By fast nastulia is nastulia ya, cumal suesria is loose na hoike acre. O mochrach, she ean a hound, yev eva, she sooler a vown, as by rock drown in lean a horricking. Glush a rash, hurste, lan essek a gun beak the yon of a shaw Vai bio tang to ye, a fa skiahin is a chasin glashed de voik. Vai follow shock and noy an an aching, is a hyan a dull for herv good turv, a fiachin fine coaches and lean. Who can shound dun your gramer as a forkach, Margunia lav karoch, vai in corny jishels on so you hook some bee. Hoshi hair garrug and lean, a kumal gramer gop and yon, a gusnak beach a hair. Mirek hal, hoshi skiahin. And yon a clapper is hooch and leonid falav a lukulier. Gislertoch, licken dunya and chian, as is yeri her echak, a doll macha shallog at out in the cricke. Rain eva grat graim erin leon, gasgrutig, is hilliki e yan focke vod du a veike. A henner, mir a beak sheener in chian shen a lorak, and beak ed bass a hug, yanihi. Stalker, ricker a shenner. Nachevius Tangal Guno Usa Aun. O Hun Kir Bliene, Chai Muk Varis Spootach, a Lorak, Erin Traik Shellbost. Hurshak Gurokiet, Kilogram Scuttle, and Brine Stamach. Ball Moor Trulish, Jirach a Suyan Avoik. Yali can Botach in Jir a Hush Shias Utten, Nur Hunukishin in the Neokin. Sanik Almshin a Hoshike a Krunyaku Skutal von Trai Fashgore. Nudava Evan is Kinchia Erikasin, Hoshike a Torsh Kolarish. On a Rukugi, by Er Fast Nas Mu Einchnicher. Nudava Clown Eke Hainok, by Er Vifiachin in the Rilton Eumsukuk. J. Behoria Yanu is J. Nach Behor. Achva Vina to Hener Eter Yaliche is Aper Gurun Lion Gala Eke Hainis Eva Kolar. Achir cool ancient, vacationic, and chorsha soul and some fasig isha suus, fata and jay yahain a dull yon talu. Nurivan the bakin and achilan, hayatar some picnic at a ganavich. Yik eat the keper in a vaca, yet an ulhugly girl na is shenever savating. 
a henner in e sugar off her in a scale ginacket, Macheta Holly, Yave Eva, a gimily she leave on the Corriganake. Throat Maha Lady, is throat na sash gorum. Ryan Eva shin, a gall graeme er a shinner, is gasocra hug hain na garstenen. Hjal and dunya a machian vur, is munyhug in the scale gin a vicari isha. Urikin, va iskir orkaun of our skirkin a clenching movinchen than ron, Naselkis, is marahika yet hunaklati, is marahilika yet the crackening. Dunya nach eisht a gristorian sheenach, va hain fatter or leek as on the rutenchen a critching. Shin gusum faka e isha a dowser and try, earn oike howdy. Va a shine, a horror like a bean agis kuach. Va a fault ho doroch rin a hatchkin as dina sechuan. Is a sullen who do rish an ar of a osen kuhn. Er crick, van cracking ron eke er a fasca kukurmach. Ron eesker a gremer, is galavelish. Capaluia vire chilig yaki lish a cracking and knock and borrow knock eke goddess. Chanuriga chilig yan vur is a sonish mochracking, ye vi. A catorge a rash ye, a natchishin who get tarixa fossi ye. Nisha. Hra isha each of the gear in Dunyasha Fossig, Akvatari ne cracking whole larcher, Agistan be shit and doya sasse er eine rash, yenagie. Hurstig and possigie, Akvalan es eke gun chikigi yaki col lus buringi, get akel earned enough agis lack. Hind the bianichin shacket, is hadur de vichen ron greemer a cracken eke, Hoyati se hula hache, a hroyaun. For pasture, I can help. Nien, I is van boronach lan gragi. Hoshi he fuse a vinas mesela er in dunya eke. A charon girl leave her lacher survive son in chulch eke ek mur. How you get in unyak a shouting in a vur a smunyak man jane a hula la. Gasen tieske jumpach or haroy glachig mur an eishk. Hikige yachi gruemach, is be isha a ye mcdailike glish a hut sheriff a dish. Hud na hiesker in barach vatik in a machumur. Hanik fearful yes li inalan is fuem, a bahig oran kuhn than ian. Anish, va pouches eish gown, scoopje vo grund na mare, agis pouches arakich. Hukin chiesker sheet munal or yavnu, is a lan in dug and bunya a geo shock is a mahanis a hyanoch. Chai fichet dion a shachet, is va bron a vaichen ron har smurn. Ach un eiche ugger, hanik in nien eiche huike, e hein a nish na boronach ok nyog yautoch, na garstenen va packet vor suenche an em film plastic. A vaher, ha me rutiker a lorik, is ha me smunchen gran latze a hai. Lame in boronach lanis eiche jevaun. Raki and package fuscoche is huri and phallic salcha milish. Rai tron valle cas rucha is sheas kunamare. Vai jishal. Voi he gun on near naiker er relenting. Huki porky is at the hutch na jord sheersha hurtin. Van saling mad bianok er leapin of eichen ron. Rapi and sheen at ord vor havich is kurian and lavin the hina e. Rake shaw is chikamakas shaw. Chanel me a geary gum falavu, evam. Slan lat, a grey, ha me a chilig yan vur farm bun me. Hurrian cracking chimicha orre is koshiki gusloetoch yan ishke, a fehu or son in ahrochi. Achavur, vay ahrochu. Vai nas blaye, nas alue. Hagoa can crack in the shavoy geke. Hoshike a bullock nahug is a shaku, a cowl a hoopal jock. Hook town mori gachilical guchir. Hali greamer a crack in is glack the sruene, gathlerto ge fall of rupe. Hoyat ear er, er flawed marklossoch. Is er fare a dull and machish shallig. Gian trocker or him, let go chilig yachi, ye vivachin ron. Akva vur jidoch a bakal rash, gonna be gal fiashti.
is mar sin huiri bín beha i tír. Ráni áche fasgi ye hín an an gioe, e ke chlatoch, fan an chíke gan nian eich ge chíli ore. Ach a jachí jachí gan dunia eich ge tuluch, em ferigat cha cuch sárse blíon eich ina rás. Hunig ín na tráin a líon eich le scútal is le sprúilach, is leif chachas a gael tarish a chúin. Ha fein a grá gan cleinu a hór an hást ar a gói, is he a gionta a múrn na mara. Gionta a Eva is chóiat a ér a sénar le súl an gír. Chá náu mar sén a hán sgeilach a dó a hénar. Ha a chílig ian vúr agus ha a tóliche le na rón ele agus bí a tórs tór éisg don tróloch a gér tír. Júsig sí mú ján sin sgol. Wael meitál, ha sgeilach gan an cóni a gáharachag, rík ar an dunia, Díroch man in sól man cúrstach, orst. Fertig tu caus an bia ye an ulish in skeelach, san latze a hai an is. Weil, a shar limeset in story a yeis mis ni gal lai gain, va an che akit se rov ronach. Lik an dunia mach gare, hau kiarst a grai, a tors pok ye er a kiaun, si a va. Yerich eva an urshin is gaun si harish, er a gana vich ans na botan an eike. Throw it to Henner, Hursty, famous in Kumal Arn. Huria mach a lav hooker is lay a kuchukuk hasten shell and dunya. Ik a muik mur noch kyan ron as kyon and ishke, a kumal sul yer ora. Thank you for listening to this episode of Testing Grounds from the Nordic Alliance of Artists' Residencies on Climate Action. You can find out more about the project at narca.art. If you enjoy the podcast, please tell your colleagues and friends and leave us a rating and a review. This episode featured Mary McLeod reading her story Kurt Namara, or Seasickness. It was produced by me, Katie Revel. Our series music is by Loris S. Sarad and our artwork is by Yagoda Sadowska. Thanks also to Alex Mars, Charlotte Hetherington, Lena Kayla, Alexia Holt, Harry Stave, Vibeka Kohler, Jakob Fabricius, Rose Tetkat, Helena Selder, Lisa Otogena, and Eben Mosbeck. The members of NARCA are Cove Park in Scotland, Sari Residence in Finland, Skafeld Art Centre in Iceland, Art Hub Copenhagen in Denmark, Baltic Art Centre in Sweden, Narsak International Research Station in Greenland, and Artica Svalbard in Norway. Narka's initial three-year programme is generously supported by Kona Foundation and Nordic Culture Fund. <laughs>